have a Bible with you, <clears throat> then uh, can you find, please, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, chapter 11, <clears throat> book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and uh, we'll, we'll make a start there, and I want to pick out really one verse, um, which relates back to what Valentine, I'm just looking around, I've seen Valentine's children this morning, but he may be working. He was talking to us a couple of weeks back about um, not so much whether you've come to faith, but what sort of, what sort of job you make of it once you, once you have found faith, or faith has found you. And... Uh, well, let's just pick out one particular verse, <clears throat> and I'm looking at Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 35, and at the end of the verse, it says, um, well, others, people went through things, people went through difficult things, hard things, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, that's a really good phrase for me. A good phrase for the Christian to adopt. Obtain a better resurrection. Yeah, that's a good start, isn't it? And this chapter is a chapter about faith. <clears throat> about believing God whatever your circumstances, and many of the early parts of the chapter about, are about getting, getting the victory in things. And uh, it goes through, well, it starts at the beginning, it goes from creation through how Abraham and how the patriarchs and how Moses found faith. And then uh, he speeds up, the writer, and says, what more could I say? Time's going to fail me. Um, what about Gideon? What about Barak and Samson and David and Samuel, who through faith subdued kingdoms, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions? All examples to God's people of holding fast faith. And after he says this little phrase, the writer um, about obtaining a better resurrection, the list kind of changes then. It's still a list of people who were in faith looking to their God for a better resurrection, but the list becomes those who suffered, those who had trials of mockings, scourgings, imprisonment, stonings, temptations, People who wandered, well, in the end it says, around, destitute, afflicted, of whom the world was not worthy. <clears throat> of whom the world wasn't worthy of them because they were looking to God to obtain a better resurrection. And that's a very good phrase for us to adopt. I'm assuming there that you do know in your heart about the resurrection from the dead to faith of those who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Perhaps we better, perhaps we better just roll back a little bit. Look with me at, please, if you've got a Bible, at a verse near its very end. I'm going to almost the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And I'm going to read out um, a verse about, about how the resurrection works in our hearts. Bless, I'm reading verse 6 of chapter 20. Blessed and holy is he or she... The Bible uses that word collectively. Let's not be too politically correct, okay? 
mankind is male and female. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Now that is not a difficult idea to get our heads round. Well, so we just take a little bit of time to understand what John is saying about a first resurrection, a first death, a second resurrection, and a second death. Now, it's honestly not hard to understand. One more verse, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. These are, um, we're, we're cutting into where um, Jesus gave John messages for the churches that were scattered around um, in Asia Minor as we know it now. And to every church he said, now come on, be an overcomer through your faith. And he says in verse 11, he who overcomes shall not be hurt, shall not be hurt by the second death. There's a first resurrection, first death, the second resurrection, second death. Not difficult to understand. Those who, those who were in the house group on Friday were listening to Nicky Gumbel, and he went back to that story of the beginning in Genesis and just brought the spiritual truth out of the story of what happened in the garden with the first man and woman and how they, they fell into disobedience. They believed the lies of the accuser and they died. Well, they didn't die physically. That's not what happened. You can read the story. They died inwardly. They became inert, lifeless, no, no senses awake to God. And that's what happened in the beginning with mankind. And however you read the story, it's the best exploration there possibly can be of the state humanity is in now. It's become inert to God, lifeless. And what John is saying in the Revelation is that's the first death. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first resurrection that occurs in the human heart is that you and I who were dead to him are awakened, brought to life, brought to an awareness of the presence of God in the heart. That's the first resurrection. Something like that happened to Jacob at Bethel. God's here. God's here. This is the, the house of God. Now, when that happened to Jacob, first of all, it was when he was on a journey. And only gradually, as the Lord kept coming to him over, over decades, actually, he began to realize here is the house of God, the dwelling place. Amen. That's the first resurrection. And oh, to those who have been made partakers of the first resurrection and are alive from the dead inwardly, Guess what? The second death. No power. No power. No power. Nothing, nothing to be afraid of in the second death. Amen. 
He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So what we have to learn as we walk this life, and that's a place where we will all get to sooner or later, unless the Lord comes again, is to be overcomers. To be overcomers. And that's, that's, that's not some kind of great military. It's not that at all. It's the God works faith in the awful challenges I face. Amen. That I learn in the particular trials, and sooner or later they will be severe for everyone, not all the time. To look to Jesus. In, in, the, in the real difficulty I personally face, how am I going to overcome? Looking unto Jesus. Author and finisher of faith. Amen. That's, that's, that's overcoming faith. And here's a phrase to get a hold of in the things that I have to go through. In it, I'm going to obtain a better resurrection. Amen. Because of this difficulty that has happened in my life, I didn't want it. It may have been my fault. It may not have been my fault at all. How do I respond as a Christian to this, this difficulty which seems too big for me? Looking unto Jesus, I am determined to obtain a better resurrection because of what I have to go through. That's the faith of Hebrews 11. I'm going to do it. I'm going to obtain a better resurrection because of the circumstances of my heart and life. That's the heart of faith. That's the heart of the Old Testament saints who left an example. They not finished off. They didn't have the grace that you and I have. They didn't... Uh, they looked to God. They, they knew he intervened. They knew he was powerful. They knew he cared. They didn't know the name of Jesus. Amen. They left an example for you and me that in the, in the difficulties I may face tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock or midweek or whenever it is, I'm going to obtain a better resurrection. Helen and I are, uh, are fans of um, a writer who became very popular about the time we came to the Lord. Um, you can still get his books. They're still in print. They're called Christian Classics now. He's a man called Watchman Nee, a Chinese Christian who was imprisoned and eventually died in a labor camp for serving the Lord and in communist China. And Watchman Nee said this. He said, the tragedy of many Christians is that they're far enough on with God to not be of much use to the world. You know what's coming, don't you? But they're not far enough on with God to be of use to him. Oh, he's on to something there, isn't he? <clears throat> the New Testament writers ha ha have a, a, a way of looking at this they, they, they kind of call it wilderness Christianity. I got out of Egypt. I escaped. I know what redemption means. But I'm wandering around in the... I'm in relationship with him. But I'm wandering around in the wilderness. I need to look to Jesus. We looked a month or so back. The name Jesus is the name Joshua. Moses got them out of Egypt. 
Joshua got them in to where they were appointed to dwell. Joshua got them in to the land where promises were all fulfilled, where they were meant to dwell. Joshua took them in. And if the New Testament has a word of warning to us, we've got a five minutes. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. There are various places we could turn, but I'm going to turn with you to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Bit of a warning for all of us. <clears throat> and uh, there are other places we could go. We could stay in Hebrews. Because various New Testament writers use the story of what happened in the wilderness to, to well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me read verse 11 to start with. These things happened as examples written for our warning to, to wake us up. For our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Well, well, what things were written? Wilderness Christianity. <clears throat> and there's a story here in 1 Corinthians 10 about the grumblers, the murmurers, the complainers. Those are all different translations in different versions of the Bible. People who... Um, were baptized into Moses, they, they, they'd escaped from old Egypt in the cloud and the sea, and they ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. But with most of them, God was not pleased because they were murmurers, they were complainers, they were wilderness Christians. God never intended that his people should be a long time in the wilderness. He never intended it. And we can take that as a lesson to us for our hearts now. God does not intend that we should spend long periods of time in a murmuring, complaining, out of sorts, wilderness sort of state. We all might have our moment, but we're to pass through it into a place where we're meant to dwell. The Old Testament people, they waited while Joshua and the other spies went into the land 40 days. 40 days, a brief period, while, while the land was spied out. And Joshua came back and he said, it's wonderful. That's where we're to dwell. It's a, it's a land flowing with everything we need. It's a place God has prepared for us. Come on, let's go. Well, I want to go. I want some leeks and garlic. I want to go. After 40 days, they should have gone straight into the land. They wouldn't believe him. They looked at their circumstances, not at Joshua. And you know the story, 40 days turned into 40 years. What a terrible existence. 40 years, murmuring, complaining. 40 years. Until most of them, they missed it. They missed it. Joshua and Caleb, they just wanted to get into the land, to get into where God has got for us. And, uh, well, perhaps we'll come back to this another time. But I really do want to say this morning, follow Joshua, okay? You may have to go through a Jordan but it's a, uh, Jordan was the lowest place on earth, still is. It's the lowest place on earth physically. We may have to humble ourselves, all right? Bow the knee to Jesus. I'm, I'm sorry for all my unbelief, for my murmuring, for my moaning. 
But I'm prepared. Here's a baptism to go through the Jordan. To humble myself. Joshua, Jesus, take me in to a land of plenty. We're meant to live as overcomers. It's not that all difficulties disappear. I mean, we could read the story. It's not that once they'd entered the land and been through another wonderful baptism, that, that there wasn't enemies, there weren't difficulties, there wasn't more land to be taken, but fundamentally they were located in the place they were meant to be. That's the pattern of Christianity. What Watchman Nee called, you may have heard the book, that's the normal Christian life. That's normal. God is filling my heart and life. He supplies what I need. I have everything I need to dwell in him. Yes, there are difficulties. Yes, there are enemies. But I'm dwelling in God. I read something last week, an American commentator, um, and he was, he was arguing with a favorite hymn writer of mine, he would be, because his name was William Williams of Pantakellen. And William Williams of Pantakellen wrote, When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. And this commentator was saying, well, it's, that's, that's true. But unfortunately, that hymn has almost become too popular because the truth of entering into the promises of God it's, it's not when we come to that Jordan of the end of our physical life. I mean, that's one way to see it, but it's not the main way the New Testament writers used. The New Testament writers, like Paul in Corinthians, were saying, enter into the promises of God now. Don't hang around in the wilderness. You may have to pass through briefly, but be an overcomer. Dwell in his grace, dwell in his love. <clears throat> Amen. I, I'm going to have to stop. It's five past twelve. <clears throat> Our last hymn is quite appropriate, Addy was very keen that we sing some of these Getty hymns, and I, I agree with him. This last hymn, it's about standing on the promises of God. Now, I'm going to invite you to do that this morning as we, as we sing together, okay? No, I'm not going to hang, wander around in the wilderness. What God told Joshua was, every place where your foot shall tread... That will belong to you. Stand on the promises. Don't fall on our weaknesses and challenges and enemies who are bigger than we are. Stand on the promises. We, we're going to sing that together. We've, we've done it before. Um, Addy, how does that start?